That's right. And uh, he did improve uh, from the previous stroke. All the other parameters, and particularly the cardiological parameters, were unchanged. So was the ECG and the echocardiogram, which was basically normal, normal left ventricular function. This time, the patient has uh, learned the lesson. And uh, he's taking the drug, and uh, his blood pressure is uh, under strict control. It's uh, about 130 and 135, which for its age, he was 68 years old, is uh, quite uh, a good uh, blood pressure. And that tells you how important it is for the patients to be convinced to take the drugs. And very often, until they have something really wrong, they try to minimize all of this. We did an echo Doppler of the supraortic trunks, and there was a classical diffuse thickening of the intima, no real stenosis. Here you have the blood test, and you can see again, we cardiologists, despite all what Charlotte said, we are not doing well because uh, the total cholesterol is still very high, LDL cholesterol excessively high, and the triglycerides are also high. And uh, I think that we need uh, to really ask ourselves uh, why we did so badly and uh, what is the target for LDL cholesterol in uh, a patient's in this condition? Is it uh, below 75, 65, 55, or 50 milligrams per deciliter? What do you think? The recent guidelines have uh, reduced the level of LDL cholesterol in the disease situation uh, below 55. Okay, and this is uh, what the guidelines are suggesting to us. They are putting a new target, which uh, was very well known to all of you. And they're saying, if you cannot reach this target with just the statins, is uh, indicated to add the ezetamide. And uh, nowadays are also available combination of starting with the ezetamide, which are very handle, and by the way, I'm also taking one of these combination. If uh, uh, you cannot reach this target, and if the patient is high risk, like in this one, the PCSK9 inhibitors uh, are also indicating, this patient should really receive uh, an ACE inhibitor, and uh, he should uh, receive um, also a beta blockers, probably, although there are less certainties about the beta blockers. If the ACE inhibitors is uh, uh, not tolerated as it was in these patients, uh, usually we use uh, in uh, ARBs. But I put it, uh, the red uh, bed because uh, I spent a lot of my life and uh, to study the differences between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And I can tell you that only the ACE inhibitors are able to protect the heart. And they are protecting the heart not only because they are reducing blood pressure, but also because they are acting on the life and death of the endothelium. ACE inhibitors, uh, the endothelium and the endothelium of our coronary arteries is committing a suicide and it is regenerated every three months. And if this uh, life and death cycle is not well controlled, and if you have more apoptosis of the endothelium than regeneration, then you will have a hole in the endothelial layer. You will have a loss of continuity in the endothelium layer and it is there where all the atherosclerotic uh, biochemical process will uh, start and uh, proceed. 
Now, only the ACE inhibitor are able to reduce apoptosis and to increase the regeneration of the endothelium, not the ABs. So in a patient uh, who is um, at uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, please try to use ACE inhibitor and not ABs, even if the ACE inhibitors can uh, uh, provide uh, some uh, uh, cough. Although in uh, our and my experience, cough is a very rare phenomenon. This is the ECG. You can see quite a normal ECG. The heart rate is 62 beats per minute. So that is uh, uh, quite good. And uh, in January 2022, he experienced severe and prolonged chest pain at home. Uh, this patient is uh, from uh, Ferrara. And uh, Ferrara, you have to know, is uh, a small university town in north of Italy. It is uh, between uh, Florence and Venice, or Bologna and Venice. Is uh, a, a town with uh, 100,000 inhabitants only one cardiological department, which is very good because there are no so many issues. And uh, we have been able to conduct uh, a rather strong campaign through the years. And uh, this was a campaign uh, done with the population. Uh, even we, we did... Uh, song, we did um, a lot of things. And so the patients uh, are quite uh, scared about chest pain and they call immediately the ambulance because this is what we have been uh, told them. And so the admissions in the cat lab is uh, rather short. Uh, Charlotte said that uh, um, time is uh, brain, and you know time is also heart. And uh, we are between Italy, uh, I should say we were because I'm no longer in charge, but we were between the best in times of pain to the cat lab, and the diagnosis is made in the ambulance. The ambulance goes directly into the cat lab, and this patient has been treated with a primary angioplasty. You can see that the anterior descending coronary artery, you can see the wire, you can see the stent in the descending coronary artery. You will see that there was a good reperfusion and the descending coronary artery has appeared again with all his branches and so on. So I would say a rather simple kind of primary angioplasty. Now, the course was uncomplicated and the patient was discharged with candesatan and hydrochlorothiazide, bisoprolol, lercanedipine, we wanted to uh, further increase the, the antihypertensive drug. Atorvastatin was increased uh, to 40 milligrams, and uh, of course, aspirin and uh, clopidogrel. Clopidogrel was chosen in these uh, patients. Normally, we use ticagrelor, but clopidogrel is uh, less aggressive, and uh, we were quite. Uh, worried about uh, the previous uh, hemorrhage in the brain. And uh, normally we continue this uh, uh, double therapy for 12 months, but in this case, uh, it was continued only for six months because of the worries about uh, the brain. We requested to the patient to continuously control the blood pressure and to do the lipid assessment uh, regularly every three months, because uh, this is uh, quite important. This is the ECG, which uh, can show uh, a very clear anterior myocardial infarction in uh, V1, V2, and V3. And um, uh, this is the echocardiogram. And uh, you can see that there is uh, a dyskinesia 
in the anterior region is not uh, a particularly important, but still is uh, this kinesia. The ejection fraction has been calculated to be 40 to 45 percent, and um, there is uh, uh, a left ventricular, uh, mild left ventricular hypertrophy. What the guidelines uh, suggest for uh, patients uh, like that and what there is new in terms of treatment? Well, for the first time, uh, the guidelines are considering lifestyle improvement uh, as uh, a drug. And this is uh, uh, very important. We are really not able to improve the lifestyle of our patients. And uh, the reason for that, at least in Italy, is that we do not have enough time to dedicate to the patients in order to convince how much is important uh, to change some of their attitude. In Ferrara, um, we started a prevention department outside to the hospital where we run a cookery course. We took the patients uh, to walk with us. We uh, try to work with the psychologist in order to convince them to stop smoking and so on. And uh, the center is working quite uh, well, but of course is uh, working quite well with the patients who are willing to come and to spend some time in the center. And uh, not everybody is willing to do so. Of course, we have to use uh, drug treatment, and for drug treatment, uh, aspirin for all, addition of second antithrombotic in the high-risk patients, and um, preferring uh, DOAC or NOAC uh, to vitamin K antagonist, and uh, um, preferring prasugrel or ticagrel over clopidogrel. This is what the guidelines are suggesting, but we choose clopidogrel because of the fear of another hemorrhage. And uh, six months later, he came back, no chest pain, no dyspnea, blood pressure was under control, and eventually, now, too late, wrong of us, the cholesterol is still high, although has uh, uh, declined quite substantially, particularly the LDL cholesterol, but they should go down uh, even more. And so uh, probably this is a patient in which uh, PKC9 inhibitors are indicated because he's already taken the combination of ezetamide and uh, rosuvastatin. And, uh, oh, well, no, sorry. This was the time when we substitute uh, atorvastatin with uh, rosuvastatin and uh, ezetamide. And uh, after a few weeks, despite uh, we did uh, all what we could, something has happened to these patients. So he's a really good patient for a neurologist and cardiologist. And uh, indeed, a few weeks later, He's admitted to the emergency department for aphasia and uh, transient motor deficit. In fact, he doesn't come right away to the emergency uh, department. And um, he, he really had the symptoms, the motor and of the... So it's not exactly the same. Huh? It was uh, right liveresis and paresthesia for five minutes. And after that, he felt perfectly normal and continued to walk the dog. And because he had an appointment the day after, when he came to uh, the outpatient clinic, he mentioned uh, that he had these uh, transient symptoms. But he, he was not, so he was not uh, anxious about uh, what happened because everything went back to normal and there was no pain. So you see him 24 hours after the symptoms. His neurological exam is normal, but he had during five minutes a motor deficit and a sensitive deficit. So what would you do? He's on aspirin alone. So would you prescribe clopidogrel on top of aspirin while waiting for the neurology consult? Would you request a CT scan as soon as possible? 
Or would you refer the patient to the emergency department? Because requesting a CT scan as soon as possible when you are in your outpatient clinic will probably take a few days, if not a few weeks. So some of you are prescribing um, clopidogrel on top of aspirin. And I would say that this is really dangerous because you do not know what's in the brain and never prescribe antiplatelet drug to a patient with neurological symptoms, focal, even if transient, because it can be a bleed. So never do that. You can request a CT scan, but on a CT scan, you will not have a clue of what happened and you can miss the right diagnosis. So here is either a multimodal CT scan with vessels and perfusion, or it's an MRI. And in fact, to have that, we are within the first 24 hours or just after 24 hours, really the best way to manage this patient because he's at very high risk of another um, deficit, which could be this time definitive. Then you refer the patient to the emergency department for uh, the stroke specialist. And uh, you really have to assume that uh, in a patient who has a sudden focal neurological deficit, it is a stroke until proven otherwise. And it can be ischemic, but it can also be a very small cortical bleed. So you, have, you need a, a, a brain imaging. You have to keep in mind that the duration of TIAs most of the time are less than an hour. And very often it's less than five minutes. So it's very short uh, period of time for a deficit, but the transient deficit is probably the best window to improve secondary prevention in those patients, because this is when there won't be any scar in the brain, there won't be any uh, functional dependency. So it's really, I would say, nearly a magical opportunity for strengthening secondary prevention. But you really also have to understand what is not a, a TIA. Well, what is not a TIA, it's all those non-focal signs, which are not compatible with a stroke. An isolated alteration of consciousness or malaise, an isolated dizziness, an isolated confusion, general weakness, lipothemia, or an isolated amnesia is not compatible with a stroke. This is very important to explain to the patient because I'm sure that this patient, and of course, he already had an MI, so he knows that if he suddenly has chest pain, he has to call 911. But think about your last outpatient clinic. How many times did you say to your very high-risk cardiovascular patient, if suddenly you have a weakness in the arm, in the leg, if suddenly you have a disturbance in your speech, if suddenly you lost vision in one eye, even if it's just for five minutes, call 911, it could be a stroke. I think none of you do that. But right. this patient is at very high risk of that. And of course, healthcare providers need, need to be able to identify this patient there's public awareness and, uh, and it's often neglected because there's no pain, it's transient and people do not understand the risk of a real stroke. So basically the management of this patient, ideally within the, 20, the first 24 hours, first it's imaging. And the truth is that this MRI with lots of brain microbleeds and cerebral amyloid angiography is the MRI of this patient with this CT scan strictly normal? And you can have a very small cortical bleed with a normal CT scan, but explain the symptoms. And if you give aspirin, you will have a problem with this patient. So see, plain CT scan is not enough. You need a brain MRI or multimodal CT with perfusion and vessels. You want to see the vessels here in our patient. You could have a, a tight intracranial stenosis of a mid, right middle cerebral artery, or you could have a cortical superficial siderosis, which is a very small, tiny bleed that explains the symptoms. Or you could have different multiple spots in different 
part of the brain in the diffusion weighted sequences that would urge you to search for AF or cardiac source. So you see all that you will learn from a deep phenotyped uh, MRI. So the, the, the MRI shows no bleed and no diffusion weighted ischemic lesion. So it's really a TIA. So what could be the cause of the TIA here? So could it be from a cardiac source? And, and more than the mitral regurgitation, I, I would be quite anxious about the um, dyskinesia of the left ventricle that we saw on the echo uh, earlier. Could it be atheroma uh, on the carotid? Could it be AF? And yes, of course, it can be all of the above because MI is just atheroma in the coronary artery, ischemic stroke. You can have many different causes and you have to search for them because secondary prevention will not be uh, the same. And um, yes, uh, we would like to increase secondary prevention. And here, I will not talk for the moment about antithrombotic choice, but basic steps to prevent a new stroke. Would, you, would it be better BP control, better lipid control, more communication with the patient to inform him on the risk of uh, the disease? And um, yes, once again, it's all the above. And I would particularly insist on communication. So in our high-risk TIA patient here, we do not have AF. We have atheroma in the heart. And we could have a look carefully at the carotid uh, vessels or intracranial vessels. And if you have an atheromatous cause, of course, you have to check that it's on the right side of the brain that, we, that will explain the symptoms. So it's, if it's a symptomatic carotid stenosis, uh, you discuss endopterectomy and you discuss it quickly. Ideally, within the first 15 days after the deficit, because after that, you probably lose the benefits. And you intensify lipid lowering treatment and you screen and control for other risk factors. I hope that this patient will have learned about all the experience he had with a stroke specialist and cardiologist and that his secondary prevention will be in place.